Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, whatever. Uh, thanks for taking the time to come to this session. My name is Max Ardica, and I'm a senior technical product manager, part of the NSBU, which is the business unit in VMware that brings you NSX. And because of that, I'm here to talk to you about uh, NSX logical routing. Uh, two words about myself, then I will allow my partner in crime to introduce himself. I joined VMware eight months ago. This may sound like deja vu to you. Because, uh, and uh, after 14 and a half years in Cisco, right? So in my, I'm a small example of this switch, switching that is happening between hardware-defined data center and software-defined data center. I have to say that, okay? So uh, my name is Dave Leroy, and uh, I'm an engineering manager in NSBU um, and responsible for um, the Edge Services Gateway. Um, I joined VMware here about a year ago and uh, am also a veteran of Juniper and Cisco uh, and was in the, uh, the routing groups in both of those uh, companies. So, Perfect. So <laughs> I will cover the presentation. They will cover your hard questions, right? So depending how the session goes, I will zip out of the door at the end. But I promise that Dave is going to be your hostage. You can keep him the whole day. Just return it for dinner tonight. Thank you, Max. Yes. <laughs> okay. Let's, we don't have much, I mean, we have lots of content I want to cover, so let's go quickly to that. Before I start the question, how many of you have attended the session that the crazy guy before <laughs> presented? Okay. I'm asking because there is a, a little bit of quantum overlap, and he presented faking an, an Indian accent, so I decided to present the session faking an Italian accent, so that even if the content is overlapping, it's not going to get boring for you. Okay, so what we're going to cover here is, since I don't know how much NSX you actually know, uh, I will give you a five minutes quick introduction about NSX, what NSX is, right? I'm not going to go into the value proposition, there are sessions that covers that, but from a technology perspective, what kind of functionality NSX brings, brings to you. Then I will give you a quick logical switching primer, because in my mind, if you don't understand NSX logical switching, it will be then difficult to understand the NSX logical routing, right? Logical switching is an essential building component that you need to understand uh, logical routing. Then we'll dive into the meat of the presentation, which will last uh, 45 minutes or two hours, depending on how things go, where we'll talk about logical routing deep dive, okay? If you want to ask questions during the presentation, feel free, uh, or, as I said, we have the hostage here that will stay with you for the rest of the day. Reference sessions, the one from the crazy guy before, it's one session that I would recommend. Probably will make more sense to attend a reference design session after you have more background about the NSX technology, right? So logical routing, you understand logical routing, then you go to see the reference design session. It's going to present again on Thursday, so I would suggest that you go uh, and see that again. So NSX introduction, what, what is NSX? NSX is a platform, and NSX provides the services that application needs to basically run, right? What does an application need to be connected to the network and be used? It needs switching, routing, security services, load balancing, right? NSX provides all this functionality, only it provides this functionality into a logical space not in the physical network infrastructure. So in this presentation, we will talk a lot about separation between logical space and physical space, right? NSX is the essential component that allows this decoupling between logical networking and physical networking. But since from the logical space I need to talk to devices that may be in physical space, NSX needs to provide also functionality we call the P2V that allows this communication to happen. Right? And so it provides this functionality both at layer two, with a, and we call that NSX layer two bridging, and provides that functionality at layer three, which is the NSX layer three logical routing. Okay? And we will talk extensively about the function that the NSX edge has to basically allow this communication between the logical space and the physical external route and network infrastructure. The components, the first thing on the bottom, obviously, is the physical network. Now, if you have, have attended other NSX session, you must now have very clear that this network must be a Cisco network. 
Okay. I'm just checking if you are awake. If, you, if it's a Cisco network, it's better for me. I still hold some stocks, right? But reality is NSX, because it provides this decoupling between logical space and physical space, does not mandate how the network needs to look like, right? So it could be a routed fabric, a layer two network. It could be a mix of vendor, a network built with a mix of vendors, right? As Nimish said before, that network represents the backplane that NSX uses to allow communication and to enable the services. All the intelligence, all the services are actually run in the logical space, okay? Only thing that we need to, from the network is to be able to carry the overlay traffic across, right? So I don't want to be naive. There is a requirement which is to enable the capability of supporting larger frame size, an MTU of 1600 byte or higher, okay? But other than that, Obviously, you want to build a, 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 a resilient network. You don't want to run your traffic over a poor network infrastructure, but that's, you don't have any specific requirement on the network itself. On top of that, there is the data plane. So NSX, the platform, has three components, data plane, control plane, and management plane. The data plane, the building block that enables all the functionality of NSX is the VDS, the vSphere distributed switch. Okay? Only thing with NSX, we have VDS on steroids, right? Because in addition to the VDS that we already support with vSphere, we actually add what we call the VIBs, vSphere installation bundles, that are pieces of software that are pushed to the VDS to enable additional functionality like distributed switching, distributed routing, distributed firewalling. The idea is to push these services as much as possible at the edge of the network. Right, where the workload, where the virtual machine connect. And this is possible by installing these VIBs on the, in the kernel of the ESXi host, on the kernel of the hypervisor. On the data plane, another component which is also critical is the NSX Edge. Okay? The NSX Edge is the Swiss army knife in NSX because it provides a, a plethora of services. The one that we will focus specifically in this session is the routing function, right? the on-ramp, off-ramp, communication that the NSX edge allows between the external physical network and the logical network, right? It's bridging, even if it's doing routing, it's bridging these two worlds, the logical and the physical, okay? But it's in the data plane, because traffic that needs to go from the logical space to the physical network, to the internet, to the intranet, needs to go through the edge, okay? And we'll cover that point extensively. On top of the data plane, there is the control plane, which is represented by the controller, the controller cluster. The, control, the controller cluster is basically the brain of the solution. The controller cluster knows what logical network have been de uh, deployed and communicate with the control plane with the different hypervisors to gather information on who is connected where. So the controller always knows, populating its tables, only knows, always knows where each VM is connected and to which logical network is connected. However, we have a, a separation between the controller and the control plane and the data plane, such that if for some reason you lose completely the controller cluster, the data plane in the kernel of the ESXi hypervisor will continue to function, right? You wouldn't be able to do things like vMotion or create a new network, but you will be able to preserve the status quo until the controller comes back online, okay? On top of the controller, there is the management plane, which is the NSX manager, okay? The NSX manager essentially has two main functions. One, it provides a user interface that is used to basically provision or configure NSX on the ESXi, ESXi cluster part of the NSX domain. Okay? It pushes that VIBs, the pieces of software that I told you before, on the VDS to enable these logical functions at the edge of the network. In addition to that, the NSX manager could also be used to consume this logical function provided by NSX. So it will be used to, cre to create the logical switches, to create the logical routing, to, intercon to interconnect these logical switches, et cetera. You could do that through the NSX manager, or you could leverage RESTful APIs that the NSX manager present to basically consume NSX from a cloud management system or cloud management platform, CMP. An example of a cloud management system that could be used is, for example, the vCloud Automation Center, right, VCAC. 
Okay? So this is basically the quick overview of what NSX is, what services offer, and what are the building blocks of the, of the solution, of the platform. Now we're going to talk about, if you want more information, actually there is a session at 2.30 today, which is the one over here where Roberto and Ben will cover a little bit more all, the, all this component. Okay? I, will, I now want to give you a quick primer about logical switching. Right? What does it mean, logical switching? What is logical switching? So, logical, again, NSX provides an abstraction from the, uh, uh, from the physical network. It provides logical connectivity in logical space decoupled from the connectivity in the physical network. Why do we need that? Well, with the virtualization of the compute, as you guys know, you can have lots of virtual machines running in the network, and they, that sometimes brings some constraints to the network infrastructure, to the configuration of the net network itself. Right? If you want to move around virtual machine, if you want to do a, a vSphere HA and recover a virtual machine on a specific server, on a specific rack where you have compute power, you need to always, if you use VLANs, if you connect virtual machine to VLANs, you basically need to extend these VLANs across your network infrastructure. Right? So this mandates some restriction or some specific consideration of how you design the data center network. Logical switching, the use of overlay technology like VXLAN, essentially allows you to decouple the connectivity that you achieve in logical space from the configuration of the physical network. Once again, the physical network, other than being Cisco network, needs just to provide to be the backplane for, for the communication. Okay? okay, so VXLAN, why VXLAN, first of all? VXLAN is the overlay techno technology that enables this logical switching. Right? Why we pick VXLAN? Right? For this function, we could use different type of overlay. The reason is VXLAN is becoming, if you want, the de facto standard overlay technology in the market space. Right? You, we, will have, we have now NIC network interface card on servers that are able to do VXLAN encapsulation decapsulation in hardware. We have vendors, switch vendor that provides the capability of doing VXLAN encapsulation decapsulation on the switch itself. So there is an ecosystem of vendors that are embracing VXLAN as the uh, overlay technology choice. So it makes sense for NSX to keep to use that uh, protocol as well. Even if from a puristic point of view, since it's, we're doing it software on the hypervisor, we could use whatever overlay technology we wanted. Okay? And what does VXLAN does is basically it encapsulates the original traffic originated by a virtual machine, which I'm showing here like, like, a, like an Ethernet frame, it encapsulates it into an IP packet. Right? Because I need to give the illusions that these two virtual machines are actually part of the same logical segment, even if they are connected across, uh, at the opposite side of a layer 3 routed network. Okay? So I take my packet, I add the VXLAN header, and the VXLAN header is important because it has a compo an, an identifier in the header which is called the VXLAN network identifier, VNI, which you can think of the VNI as basically your VLAN ID that you are used to. Right? A VNI is simply an identifier, a number, that identifies a, a layer 2 segment, which is mapped to a subnet, the same way a 12-bit VLAN ID identifies a layer 2 segment, which is usually mapped to an IP subnet. The only difference is that VNI is long 24 bits instead of 12, which means I can have many more segments created. I don't, I'm not limited to 4K anymore. But in terms of networking, don't get confused, a VXLAN segment and a VLAN segment both represent a layer 2 domain that is usually mapped to a layer 3 IP subnet. Okay? That's how we are using them. So then there is an outer UDP header, right? And it's important to have an overlay technology that allows you to have an UDP header because it allows better load balancing of this VXLAN traffic across the core of the network if I have equal cost. Okay? And then the important part is the outer IP header, right? In the outer IP header, the source and destination IP that are put there are called VTEPs, VXLAN tunnel and point. These are basically IP addresses representing logical interfaces on the devices that provide VXLAN encapsulation and decapsulation. In the NSX case, the VTEPs are basically the ESXi host, the hypervisor, where the VMs are connected. Okay? And we will see in the next slide how this works. Okay? Uh, 
And then there is a, obviously the external MAC address, right? When this, the packet is encapsulated like this, it could be sent into the network and be sent to the destination VTAP. How does it work? I have VM1 and VM2 in this example. VM1 and VM2 belongs to the same layer two segment, which is not a VLAN, it's a VXLAN, okay? Same story. They belong to the same layer two segment, meaning they're part of the same IP subnet. VM1 wants to communicate with VM2, and it sends a packet to VM2 directly, right? The hypervisor where VM1 is connected captures the packet, does a layer two lookup to see where VM2 is connected, and you notice that it's not con locally connected, but it's actually connected to a remote host, okay? He has an IP address associated to that MAC address. That's the indication to the hypervisor that what needs to happen, it's a VXLAN encapsulation of the original frame, which is then sent into the, net, the transport network with destination, the VTAP of the, of the remote ESXi host. All the network needs to do at that point is to be able to bring the traffic from the source ESXi host to the destination ESXi host, right? If the network you have built doesn't allow you to do that, you have a bigger problem to solve than thinking about NSX, okay? So IP connectivity is all we need, really. The VM, the ESXi host, the remote ESXi host receives the packet, decapsulates it. While it decapsulated, it looks into the VNI, the VNI identifier in the VXLAN header, so it knows in which layer to domain to do the lookup for the destination, and then it sends the packet to VM2. So from a VM1 and VM2 perspective, it's like if they are connected to the same segment. But in reality, the transport network in the middle could be whatever network you want, okay? That's the power of connectivity in the logical space, okay? Now that this is clear, we're gonna build on top of that. Well, I put a reminder actually to a performance review, overview session, because you may think, what is the implication of doing this VXLAN encapsulation, decapsulation of traffic, right? What is the impact on, uh, on CPU, et cetera? I'm not covering it here, but if, I think this afternoon at 5.30, Sai and Puja will cover that in this session. So if you're interested into that, go and check and check the session. That said, we can now dive into the logical routing, right? Now that you know what NSX is, and you know what, how logical switching happens, right? How do we use this logical switching capability to then build on top of it and create routed, logical routed topologies? So the goal or the principle is the same, pushing the services as much as possible to the edge of the network. And more the edge than the hypervisor you cannot find, right? Because the hypervisor is really the point where you connect your VM. So the idea here is that not only um, I'm gonna be able to do logical switching at the hypervisor level, but I wanna also be able to do logical routing. That's what NSX allows you to do with this functionality called distributed routing, right? Again, we have this VIB that we push during the provisioning phase of NSX, we push to the hypervisor. This VIB allows the enablement of a distributed routing function on, all, on the kernel of all the ESXi host part of the NSX domain. Doing that provides two immediate advantages. One is scalability, because instead of having a central router like in traditional data center design at the aggregation, I have a pair of aggregation boxes that need to route traffic between all the subnet, I distribute the duties to all the hypervisors that are at the edge of the network. So I build a giant distributed router, okay? Second, optimization of the traffic path. Because if I have two virtual machines connected to the same hypervisor in different subnet, they need to talk to each other, normally I will have to go out in the VLAN that the virtual machine source belongs to, get to the gateway, and then come back in the destination subnet back to the VM2. Okay? With the distributed routing, we are able to basically shortcut that functionality at the hypervisor level itself. Okay? So optimization of traffic path, optimization of work, or load work, workload. What are the components of logical routing? So distributed routing is very important, but it's only one phase of the, of the medal, right? Uh, in NSX, logical routing has two components. There is the distributed routing, and there is the centralized routing. Everyone has his own role, right? So the distributed routing, as we said, is used for optimizing east-west communication between the VXLAN, between virtual machine connected to VXLAN segment. So think about that like intra-data center east-west communication, okay? Optimize at the hypervisor level. 
And there are two components that enable that functionality. A data plane component and a control plane component. The data plane component is, again, the VIB that is installed in the kernel of the hypervisor, right? So every hypervisor runs, it's like, think about it like he runs a little router where, which has directly connected all the VXLAN segment that I want to interconnect between, bet, uh, across, right? So if I want to communicate red to green, I connect my VXLAN red and VXLAN green to the logical router, to the distributed router, and that means on each hypervisor, I have this leader router with these directly connected segments, okay? And that's the data plane component. But there is also a control plane component, which is what we call the DLR control VM. That's essentially running the control plane, the routing protocol, which will be used to communicate or to establish routing adjacency with the edge to exchange routing information. And we will see how it works in the next slide, okay? So these two components, data plane and control plane, which obviously are decoupled, right? And we will see when we talk about fillover that I could lose the control VM without any impact on the data plane of the DLR, right? Because the data plane happens in the kernel of the hypervisor. But distributed routing is good for east-to-west communication. What happens if I need to provide communication then to the external network? Think about I deploy a multi-tier application in my logical space. I have a VXLAN for the web tier, application tier, database tier, and I need essentially external client to connect to the web tier, right? That external client lives in the physical network outside there, right? So I need to be able to provide connectivity between the external physical layer three network infrastructure and the logical web tier, right? One is sitting here, one is sitting there. Who provides this connectivity is basically the NSX edge, okay? The NSX edge is basically the centralized routing element that takes care of the, what we call the north-south routing, the north-south communication between the physical infrastructure and the logical segment, the logical VXLAN, then I define a logical space, okay? So the combination of this component give you the overall logical routing capability that you need with NSX. There is a session, if you wanna know more about the NSX edge and the other function, because as I said, the NSX edge is the Swiss army knife that not only provides routing services, but provides also firewalling, load balancing, NAT. There is a session this afternoon that basically covers uh, that in detail. Okay, you have a reference there. So what would happen if I didn't have distributed routing, right, for east-west? Well, as I said before, if I have two virtual machines, a virtual machine one sitting in a green VXLAN 5001 segment and a, v and a virtual machine VM2 sitting in the red, if VM1 wants to talk to VM2, what will need to happen is that the traffic will have to leave the source hypervisor, be VXLAN encapsulated and sent to the hypervisor where my edge, centralized edge works, uh, is actually up and running, the centralized edge would basically do a layer three lookup, will provide routing capability from the green VXLAN to the red VXLAN, and then re-encapsulate the packet and send it back to the source hypervisor to be delivered to the VM2, right? So even if the two VM connected to the, uh, uh, to the same hypervisor in different, uh, in different subnet, I will have to go out in the network, go to the server where the edge is running, and come back. Suboptimal, okay? Additional latency, suboptimal, using the net bandwidth network for, for, no, for no reason, okay? Distributed routing obviously fix that. How does how do these components interact with each other? So, if you look at this diagram, right, we have the NSX edge, the centralized routing engine that provides north to south routing function between the physical network and the logical space. And we have the DLR. The DLR has the two components that I said, a data plane component, okay, which is the kern in the kernel of each hypervisor, and the control plane component, which is my DLR control VM, which runs the routing protocol, okay? So the first thing I do when from the NSX manager I create a logical router instance because I wanna interconnect my VXLAN segment, what's gonna happen essentially is that the NSX manager communicate to the controller the creation of this logical network, this, this logical router. The controller pushes this information to all the hypervisor, 
Remember, the controller has a control plane with all the hypervisors. So he communicates that information, and so he basically instantiates the leader router on all the kernel of all the ESXi host part of the NSX domain. And he attaches to each of these routers the same logical segment that needs to be interconnected. Okay? So all these subnets are always seen as directly connected to the distributed router instance. Okay? But also, the control VM will establish a figure, the routing protocol that needs to be run on the control VM to peer with the edge. Why do I need this peering? For two reasons, right? Because if I want to allow communication from the external network into the logical space, point one, the external network needs to know about this subnet, okay? The subnet that I define in logical space. How does he know about that? He knows it because the control VM communicates the information about these three subnets that you see here to the edge, and the edge can then advertise the routes into the physical infrastructure, okay? So the physical infrastructure knows that there are subnets that, that are reachable into the, in, in the logical space of the data center. And obviously, I have control of which of the subnets I advertise outside. If I have a three-tier application, there is no point usually in advertising application and database subnet. I just advertise the web tier IP subnet, for example. Okay? On the other direction, the distributed router, the little distributed router in kernel on each hypervisor needs to know when the traffic needs to return into the external network, needs to know that the edge is actually the next layer three hop toward the external network. And that information is passed by the edge to the control VM, okay? And when the edge passes that information to the control VM, the control VM communicates that information to the controller, and the controller pushes, pushes it to all the hypervisors, okay? So all the leader router running in the kernel of the hypervisor know, and usually the information that I need is a different route, because anyway, when I want to communicate with the external world, I need to go to the edge. Right? So all the leader router in the hypervisor know that when I wanted to communicate with the outside world, send the traffic to the IP address here that identifies the NSX edge. Okay? So at that point, the data plane happens, and as you can see, the data plane bypasses completely the control VM. The control VM is only used to run the control plane, the routing protocol. Okay? All the data plane is between the edge and the specific hypervisor, specific router installed in the kernel of the hypervisor. That is clear because it's an important point, the separation between control plane and data plane of the distributed router, okay? So if we look at the example that we had before, if I enable distributed router, if I push this routing functionality to the hypervisor, what happens now? Now I have the same situation where VM1 wants to communicate with VM2. When he sends the packet, now his default gateway is not anymore an edge sitting on a different host, but the default gateway is, actu is actually locally instantiated, right? It's a distributed router running in the kernel of the hypervisor where VM1 is connected. So the packet gets to the default router here, which as you can see has two leaf logical interfaces, one in the subnet green, one in the subnet red. That's why all these VXRAN are always directly connected, okay? And he routes between green to red. He looks at the routing table and he sees that the green and the red are directly connected, so he knows I need to route between leaf one and leaf two. When I route, atmosphere, when I route to leaf two, I look at the ARP table. Every leaf, every logical interface has an associated ARP table, so I need to look for the ARP information, mapping information for VM2 to send the packet, to encapsulate a layer two, to do what a router does. If I have information, like in this case, I just basically send the traffic locally and I'm done. If I didn't have the information in the ARP table, the distributed router would have generated an ARP request to populate the ARP table, okay? But the point is, communication between VM1 and VM2 happens directly at the, at the, at the hypervisor level where the two VMs are connected without ever leaving the host, okay? So the network doesn't even see that traffic, okay? Now, what happens if this VM1 represents, for example, a web server that needs to be accessed from the external network? Well, in that case, as I told you in the previous two slides ago, 
the subnet green where VM1 is connected will be advertised by the edge to the external network infrastructure. So the external network infrastructure, when I have a client sitting in this cloud that wants to communicate with VM1, the traffic will do all its way to the data center, down to the uh, ESX host where the edge is basically up and running, okay? At that point, the traffic will get to the uplink of the edge, and the edge will perform a routing lookup to see how does it get to the destination, which is the subnet 172.16.10 in this case, right? It does the lookup, it sees that the destination is actually available, and the next stop is the 192.168.10.2, which is an IP address on this transit VXLAN network. Who is that, that, that 10.2? The 10.2 is the, basically the data plane forwarding address identifying the distributed router, right? It's the one that is passed by the logical router control VM when he exchanges routes with the edge. So it will tell you, okay, if you want to get to 172.16.10.10, you need to send the traffic to 192.168.10.2, which represents my distributed, data plane distributed router, okay? So the packet is then sent to that address, but it's not yet sent out of the server because the distributed router is also instantiated on the server where the edge is running, okay? So what I do, I do basically the two pipeline, the two logical routing pipeline are run inside the same hypervisor. I route a link external interface of the edge to internal interface, and I route internal, external interface of the DLR to the green subnet. So I do double routing at the ESXi host, and eventually, I need to send the traffic to the VM, to the destination VM. And at that point, it's a layer two communication in the green segment, and so that is performed by using VXLAN normally, right? It's just logical switching at that point, okay? So two routing function happening at the hypervisor here, okay? When, I don't have it for reason of time reasoning, but if VM1 wants to respond to the client, at this point, the two routing function will be decoupled. I will do distributed routing here at the source hypervisor to route between green and purple. Then I will do VXLAN to send the traffic to the edge, and then the edge will route to the external network. Okay? So routing always happens at the local ESXi host where the virtual machine generating the traffic is located. Okay? Is this clear? I hope so. Huh? Okay. So deployment topologies. Once I have, you know how it works, you could build different topologies, right? So we give you these Lego blocks. Now you can assemble them as you want to build every type of crazy topology that you, that you, you have in mind. Now the fact that you can build every type of crazy topology doesn't mean that you should build any type of crazy topologies, right? So what we're gonna show you here is the three usually more, most used topologies that we have, that we see, that we recommend to customer. The first one is the enterprise routing topology. The enterprise routing topology, usually you have one distributed router with lots of VXLAN segment connected to, right? So you have, for example, multiple application, three-tier application, web one, up one, DB one, web two, up two, DB two, which I interconnect them to the same, to the same distributed router. And then the distributed router is connected, is basically using a VXLAN transit link to communicate to the edge, to, to peer with the edge, and basically allow then communication north to south to happen, right? Now, the fact that all these VXLAN segments are connected to the same distributed router doesn't mean that I have free communication between them. If I want to, yes, I can have distributed routing communication hypervisor to hypervisor between all these segments. But if I don't want to, I'm able to apply very granular policies at the VNIC level, you know, this concept of distributed firewall or micro-segmentation. I can be at the, I can apply policy at the VNIC level and not only prevent different applications to communicate with each other, but even VM that are part of the same tier of an application, I can actually apply a policy to prevent communication if I want. Right? So don't get confused with the fact that since they are all connected to the same distributed router, then it's a free-for-all and everybody can communicate with each other. That depends on the policy that you want to apply. Okay? But the point is, 
in enterprise, usually what we see, we see many segments connected to one instance of the distributed router. That doesn't mean that if you wanted, you couldn't create a different distributed router instance. You can have up to 100 distributed router instance running on a given ESX host, right? And you can connect different applications to different distributed router instance if you want, okay? The key point why we want to have the edge in the middle between the distributed router and the physical network and the physical router is because you want to ensure that this routing here between the edge and the physical router, which usually requires the cloud architect to talk to the network guy, right, happens only once. You do that at the beginning, you establish this peering, and then on the south side, you can instantiate as many network, as many logical router you want without ever having to touch anymore this point here, right? So there is a decoupling between a one-time configuration that you do to peer with a physical router, and then what happens on the south side of the, of the, of the edge. And this is pretty clear if you look the multi-tenant routing topology, right? In a multi-tenant routing topology, you usually have, you define a tenant, an application, for example, a three-tier application represent my tenant. And I want to basically be able to instantiate as many of these tenant on demand, dynamically. I want to instantiate the tenant, I want to destroy the tenant on demand, right? And I wanted to do this without ever having to modify the configuration of my physical network obviously. Otherwise, that would defeat the purpose of being able to decouple logical connectivity to physical, okay? And so, in this case, if you see, I can have up to nine tenants connected to the same NSX edge and be able to communicate with each other if I want or not and communicate with the external world. Now, why am I limited to nine tenants? Does someone know? Bingo. You only have 10 VNIC interface on a VM. The NSX edge is a VM, right? One interface is used for the uplink. So that leaves me with nine VNIC available on the south side to interconnect, to peer with distributed logical router, to interconnect distributed logical router instances, okay? So I can have up to nine. In reality, in release 6.1, we will provide a function called VXLAN trunk that will allow you to scale this more, but for now, just keep in mind that I can have up to nine tenant connected to the same NSX edge. Another point of this topology is that since these different nine tenant connect to the same NSX edge, I cannot support overlapping addresses between them, right? So one consideration is the number of tenant. The other consideration is support of overlapping IP addresses, right? I cannot support overlapping IP addresses because they all connect to the same edge. If I want to scale out the number of tenant and I want to have flexibility in the IP addressing scheme that I use, I could build a multi-tier or a, what we call the high-scale multi-tenant topology where up to nine tenant connect to one edge, another set of nine tenant connect to a different edge, and so far and so on, right? This gives me the two benefits of increasing the number of tenants that I support in logical space, or the number of instances of multi-tier application, whatever the tenant is for, for you, and at the same time, be able to support tenant with overlapping IP addresses in the network, in the logical network, as long as the tenant with overlapping addresses are connected to separate instances of edge, okay? And all these edges are then aggregated by a, a top, what we call the route aggregation layer here, okay? Now, let me go back one second. You could think, okay, this is cool, I can do this routing topology, but if I look at this picture, you always show me one edge here, and then I have a, a, a control VM down here. What about the high availability, right? What happens if this VM here fails, or if the ESXi host where this VM is deployed fail? Do I lose connectivity for all the nine tenant connected to it? So this basically opens up to talk about high availability models, right? So NSX logical routing, what do we need to do to provide high availability characteristics to the, to the logical routing function? And reality is we need to take care of, of the two components, right? There is a control VM, the control VM function, which is the, the brain or the control plane of the distributed router, and there is the edge, 
right? For the control VM, the HA model is an active standby HA model that I will describe in the next slide. For the edge, we actually have three possible models. One is active standby HA model that works exactly the same like the control VM. At the end of the day, they, they both are VM, right? So they can use the same mechanism to provide resiliency, which is called active standby. But with the edge, I can also deploy something else. I can deploy what we call the standalone HA model, where I have two edges independent, standalone, up and running at the same time. And the evolution of this model is what we call the ECMP model, where I can have up to eight edge models active at the same time. Now we're going to dive into each of these and explain the difference and explain also the software dependency because the first two are available today in 6.0 releases. In the ECMP model will be introduced by the 6.1 release coming in September. Okay? So first is the active standby HA model. How that works, and again, this applies both to the, to the DLR control VM and to the edge. How it works is that I have an active instance of the, of the edge, in this example, and a standby. And they exchange keep alive on an internal per group, right? They exchange keep alive to basically verify the health of each other. Every second, they exchange this keep alive. If, in addition to keep alive, they also exchange state information, okay? For services that you may run on the edge, like a NAT, firewalling, load balancing, okay? All this is synchronized and forwarding table information. All is synchronized through this channel. And this channel, this keep alive are exchange every second on an internal per group, which is basically a per group connected to one of the VNIC of the active and one of the VNIC of the standby, right? Basically what happens when you deploy, deploy a pair of active, of active standby, NSX manager defines two IP addresses to the first VNIC that was defined on the edge, assigns two IP addresses in the same subnet, and the two devices, the two VMs, start exchanging keep alives, which doesn't mean you know, I need to have necessarily layer two between this active standby VM, because I could exchange them on a VXLAN segment, right? So I could leverage, again, logical switching to be able to exchange a layer two keep alive protocol across a layer three network if I wanted, okay? What happens if the ESXi, where the active edge dies? Well, what's gonna happen is the standby will detect that the, ed the active edge failed, when, uh, and I'll show you in the next slide how. And then NSX manager also detects the failure of, the, of one of the edges, and will restart the edge on a different server. Right? There is an anti-affinity rule so that the NSX manager takes care of always deploying active standby in different ESXi server. Because obviously if you, defy, if you deploy both on the same server, then it's a you know, single point of failure that you don't wanna have, right? So that's automatically done by the NSX manager, okay? NSX manager has the intelligence to place the active and standby units in different ESXi servers. So how does it look like the topology when I deploy the edge in an active standby mode? So active standby mode means out of two edges, only one is active, both for a control plane and data plane perspective. That means that if I, if I have a DLR, and actually, to be correct, the control VM DLR on the south side and a physical router on the north side, the physical router and the DLR will establish peering or routing adjacency only with the active edge. The standby edge is standby, so I have a sink of information, but it doesn't establish any control plane uh, adjacency at this point, okay? And the traffic, the data plane, also is active only through the active. If the active dies, the standby will have to detect that the active guy died and take over the active duties, okay? So here is important. So the outage of traffic that I have, and basically the data plane traffic then will restart through the new active edge. The outage of traffic I experience is basically dependent on how long this E2 edge takes to determine that E1 is dead, right? So as I told you, the exchange keep alive every second. By default, there is a dead 
detection timer, which is 15 seconds. So by default, this guy takes 15 seconds before declaring that E1 is dead. And so the outage that you will have is basically 15 seconds. You can tune it down to, to, to six seconds, and so you can basically recover the data plane traffic in six seconds, okay? But at this point, I recover the data plane traffic, but I haven't recovered yet the control plane in the sense that the new active needs to restart the routing protocol, right? And so here what is critical is to set the timers, the protocol timers long enough, right, so that the physical router and the edge, while the E2 restarts the routing protocol, do not declare that peering down. Because if the physical router of the DLR declare the peering, the adjacency with the edge down, they will basically remove routes from the forwarding table and traffic will stop. So recommendation is set the timers long, even 40 seconds, 120 seconds, the IGP, the, the, the routing timer, or SPF or EBGP, whatever you have, so that these guys has the time to restart the routing protocol without having the physical router or the DLR removing routes from the routing table, okay? Anyway, the outage is determined by how fast the E2 becomes active. It's not dependent on the timers. Question. Question is, can you use fault tolerance to protect it? You can use vSphere HA to protect that, right? Meaning you can restart the edge that failed on a different host, but it will take longer. Now, fault tolerance is actually not supported, I think. Dave, if you want to spend why it's not supported, I told you, he handles the hard questions. Oh, yeah, it's not currently supported. I was going to, I was going to point out that uh, by default, the graceful restart uh, extensions are enabled on the protocols, um, and that's the reason that... Um, once the standby takes over, the forwarding table is still, still running on the, the uh, existing uh, forwarding state until that adjacency comes up. So. Right. So short answer is full tolerance is not supported with this model. So you just leverage the fact that the forwarding table is synced, and you just need to basically recover the data plane at, uh, and shorter than that timer to recover the data plane as soon as possible. Okay? Obviously, you have this fear of chase so that actually, in this case, active standby, the NSX manager knows that you one died and will restart the one on a different ESXi host at that point. And then, when this guy restarts the routing protocol, you will reestablish the routing adjacency, and this is where graceful restart comes into the picture because the, the newly activated routing protocol on the edge, it will use gra graceful restart capability so that it will tell the other guys, hey, I just restarted, don't bring down your adjacencies, but just keep, keep me alive and uh, we, we are good, right? And so the traffic will continue. Without graceful restart at this point, you would have another outage because this physical router and DLR will, will bring down the adjacency and clear the forwarding table, okay? And you don't want that. But this is, graceful restart is enabled by default. So you don't need to worry about that, okay? Second model is what we call the standalone HA model. Right? So in this case, I have two edges, E1 and E2, which are active-active. They're independent. They're two instances of the edge, two VMs that have nothing to do with each other. So there is no keep alive exchange between them. They're just two edges active at the same time. However, that means on the control plane, they are both active. So DLR and physical router establish adjacencies with both of them. On the data plane, we need to distinguish, actually. That's the tricky part. So with 6.0 release, the DLR is not capable. So if you look at this topology, right, the DLR, if I have a prefix appear in the core, it will learn, it will get a routing advertisement for this prefix from both E1 and E2. So it will get the same route advertised by the two edges, right? It's a symmetric topology. However, in release 6.0, the DLR is not capable of installing a redundant path in its forwarding table. It only installs one path. The first one that he receives, I believe it is. That means that from the south-north communication, I only use a single path, which is, for example, the path through E1. I cannot use the one through E2, okay? On the opposite direction, it really depends on the ECMP capability of the physical router. Now, physical router usually by default support equal cost multipathing, right? So the routes that the edge 
the data center routes that the edge E1 and E2 communicates to the physical router will be installed in the forwarding table of the physical router. And so the physical router will be able to send traffic from north to south using both paths. So we have like a single path south to north, a redundant path north to south, okay? Now what happens if E1 dies? If E1 dies, the key to recover traffic as fast as possible is essentially to be able for the DLR and the physical router do, to detect as soon as possible that D1 is dead, right? Nobody else, the only control plane I have is basically the routing control plane that the DLR and the physical router had previously established with D1. So the recommendation to shorten the outage of traffic here is to basically tune the timers aggressive, or SPF or BGP timer, down to one and three seconds, so one second allow three seconds all time, so that in sub three seconds, the physical router and the DLR can detect that E1 is dead and remove it from this forwarding table. So the physical router will remove the path through E1 and keep the one through E2, so it will recover all the traffic this way. The DLR will basically use the second advertisement that it previously received that it didn't install. It will install that in its forwarding table and we start using the south to north through E2, okay? So convergence is faster because it's not based on, the, on a keep alive between the two edges, but it's based on the logical, on the uh, routing protocol uh, keep alives that was established between the DLR and the edge and the physical router and the edge. One, so convergence is better. One caveat that you have with this is that you cannot support stateful services on the edge because now you have two edges that don't sync any state information. They don't have an internal channel to sync any state information. And so you cannot support stateful firewall, stateful NAT functionality like this, okay? So for the firewall and load balancing, it's not a big deal because you can do firewall distributed at the hypervisor level, micro segmentation, and also the load balancer, you can instantiate a load balancer in one R mode instead of in line. But keep in mind that this model applies if you don't apply services on the edge. You basically use the edge only for the routing communication. The evolution of this model, which is coming in 6.1, is the one where instead of having E1 and E2 stand active at the same time, I can have up to eight. Why eight? Because they changed the code in the DLR so that the DLR can install in, in its forwarding table up to eight equal cost path for a given prefix, right? So I could deploy 10 of these edges but the routes that I receive from two extra, the two extra edges will not be installed in the DLR forwarding table, right? So it makes sense to have eight. Eight is enough, I would say, right? So you have eight that are always active, both on the control plane and on the data plane. So I established active peering with the DLR and the physical router, and the traffic will always be hashed across all these paths, both in the south to north and in the north to south direction. Right? So it's an improvement on the previous model because we, we use really the full 80 gig bandwidth for north to south, north to south, or south to north. Okay? Scale out model. In case you need all that amount of bandwidth between the physical network and the logical network. Same consideration I made before. If you do this and E1 dies, the key point here is, again, the DLR and the physical router need to detect as fast as possible the U1 diet, right? So same design best practice, which is tune down the routing protocol timers between the control, DLR control VM and, U1, and all the edges and the physical router and all the edges. So then you can achieve a sub three second convergence. And again, since these are all standalone unit, we do not support stateful services across these eight nodes, okay? So, this is a model that you scale out the bandwidth for routing, but you don't have stateful services on, okay? Is this clear? Question about this? Yes. Mm -hmm. the, your question is, 
I have a flow that goes from the physical router to E3 to the DLR. If the connection between the DLR and E3 is down, what does it mean the connection between the DLR and E3 is down? Well, usually the point is that this, the traffic, so this is a VXLAN, this is a VLAN, but this traffic is usually carried on the same physical NIC of the hypervisor, right? So it's likely that if you lose this link, logical link, because they have, you lose the NIC or you lose both NICs, you also lose the NIC, this, this uh, link up here because it's carried on top of the same physical network interface, okay? Think, don't get confused, right? This edge is running on an ESX host, right, which connects to the network, and the VLAN that I need to basically carry the traffic to the physical router or to go to the remote ESXi host where the DLR is running is basically carried on top of the same physical NIC. So if I lose, in, a, in short, and we can talk more offline, if I lose connectivity on one side, 99% of chances I also lost connectivity to the north side because the physical path is the same. And Max, okay. if I can add, at the routing layer, um, if E3, if the, if the protocol adjacency between E3 and the distributed router go down, then the routes are going to be um, withdrawn up to the physical router anyway. So he'll just sure. naturally route around it. That's the other point. From a routing protocol perspective, this guy doesn't get the subnets anymore, right? But at the physical level, keep in mind that both traffics are carried on the same physical NIC that gets out of the server, right? Question is, what are these adjacencies between the physical router and the edges? How does the physical router see the edges? You see it as a next stop, like you do show a POSPF adjacency, you see the next stop is the, you have a dot one, dot two, dot three, dot four, for example. Is there any routing protocol running between them? If, if there is a routing protocol, yes. These adjacencies is a routing protocol adjacency, right? OSPF or BGP or whatever it is, yes. So in this case, it's like having really eight plus one, nine, routers on the same uh, LAN, right? So you have, if he's OSPF, DR, BDR election, and all this type of thing. Okay, so your apologies up to this point have been pretty clear uh, on saying that I either support a high availability model with extra standby or everybody access. So there's no hybrid where I can have two pure set up and extra standby, but also routing adjacencies and stuff handled in the access. That's, that's, well, so there is one thing that is actually they need to fix, because I point out this problem, is you could do, you could actually have an active standby setup where you could have, on the south north, you have only one path, but you could have the edge connected to two physical routers and do ECMP on the north side, right? That is not working today, but it will, well, it will be working by the time we, 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 no, I still have two minutes. <laughs> but it will be working by the time we ship 6.1 probably, right? Otherwise, it's Dave's fault, and you can <laughs> work with him. OK, so if, they, if you guys have additional questions, come to me at the end. You will find Dave. Key takeaways, so we talk about, basically, what NSX is, the functionality it provides. We talk about what logical switching in is, and how VXLAN enables the logical switching, the decoupling. And we talk about logical routing that has two components, distributed for east-west, centralized on the edge for north-south, and we saw what are the HA models that we can build to basically give resiliency to the to different routing topology we can build. Here is a link to the design guide that me and the crazy guy that talked before me wrote. So here you can find way more information on how the, all this logical routing works, how the, all the recovery in the different HA model work as well, okay? So thank you for your time. Go enjoy the evening. Thank you.